Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Hashtag Ask Jochen. So this week, we have a very special guest lecture. Dr. Catalina Thiersen is joining us um, to discuss how the horse moves in a correctly fitted saddle to give us the veterinarian's perspective and the veterinarian's feel. So I'm just going to double check that we are in fact live on our platforms before we move forward, just to make sure there aren't any technical errors. And it appears we're doing well. Okay, perfect. And now I'm just going to introduce Jochen into the session today. Welcome Jochen. Hello, hello. How are you, Mary Claire? Great, great. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to also introduce Catalina, Dr. Catalina Tiersen over there. Thank you for joining Hi. us. Hi, hi. All the way from South Africa. We're so sorry we have to make you tune in so late, but we appreciate your time. It's not, it's not a problem at all. We've already you gotten a few questions. for very long, but um, it's because I'm on solar power, so the light will go come and go. Oh, but I see. It will work. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, we already have a few questions for the end of the session today, but we're all really looking forward to your presentation. And uh, so without further ado, I will hand it off to Jochen to do a short little intro and then pass it off to Catalina. All right. So let me share this screen. Well, uh, I met Dr. Katilina Thiersen in South Africa, and um, she did a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation for our educational branch from Schleser, Saddle Fit for Life. And um, what I took away with this was life-changing for me as a saddle maker, as a saddle fitter, and as a rider. And the knowledge, what I have learned from you, Katilina, was as unbelievable. And I'm so excited to have you with us. And as usual, we always start uh, our little intro with the little video, and then we go right into your presentation. So, Catalina, the floor is yours, and we are all excited to hear what you have to present today. Perfect. Thank you, Jochen. Right. Everybody's spoken about me and told you about me. I worked in several different countries. I've worked in the UAE. I've worked in the United States. I've worked in Great Britain. I've had some great mentors. Um, I've been an equine veterinarian for most of my life. Currently, I'm in South Africa. I work for a very large sport horse stud. We've got some of the, the finest blood out of Europe and specifically Germany in the stud at the moment. So very exciting things happening here. Um, but today is about saddle fit. And this is from a vet's perspective and from a vet that actually rides horses. Um, I've show jumped at a high level. I currently have two horses that are competing. They're both in Schleser saddles. Um, and it's been, it's, it's been a very, very arduous, but a, a great journey so far. So I'd like you to meet my two teachers. Um, they have taught me just about everything I know and then some, and they teach me every day still. On the left, um, as you look at the screen, the chestnut, he's um, named Chivago. He's, he's an Oldenburger, cross Cellar Francais. He jumps one meter 40. Um, on the right is my young horse. He's currently seven years old. Um, we call him Larry, but his real name is Laurentia Pride. Um, he's currently a one meter horse. Um, he got held back for probably a year and four or five months that Jochen and I struggled together to get a saddle to fit him. Um, you'll see quite a bit of him featured. He's been quite the challenge of my life and um, super, super talented horse, but a, a very complicated, very sensitive horse. And um, yeah, we learned 
the hard way. You don't argue with him about saddles. You believe him. When he says he doesn't like it, there's a reason he says he doesn't like it. So I think my message here for everybody is listen to the horses. Um, it's something in the sport that we often um, neglect and often only as we get older and we see more and we get wiser, do we actually realize that horses are remarkable beings. They're incredible, incredible, incredible animals. They allow us to get on, a, on their backs. They fight wars with us, carrying, carrying us into dangerous situations. And for all intents and purposes, we're a predator and they're a prey and they still do this for us. So they have no reason to lie. They have no reason to pretend. If they say something doesn't work, then it's our job and our obligation to go and see why they say so and not argue with them. There's no such thing as a naughty horse. And I know Jochen agrees with me on this. So um, yeah, this is my personal saddle journey that I thought I'd share with you guys. Um, Jochen knows most of it. He's been there for most of it. He's been involved in most of it. So when we started with little Larry at, as a five-year-old up in the left-hand corner over there, he was in an Albion K2 jumping saddle, which you can see he's working quite happily in and it fitted him for exactly two months, after which it stopped fitting him. Then we couldn't find anything to fit him. So we moved on to a bareback pad, which is literally, that's me riding him in a bareback pad. Um, it wasn't comfortable for him. It wasn't comfortable for me. And um, things got complicated very, very quickly. And then COVID happened and we eventually got a saddle. Um, and then we got a second saddle from Schleser and we still had problems. And then he went into a prestige. In the prestige, he jumped up into the one meters, one meters 10, he then started ride east then started jumping flat he wasn't able to clear the fences and later on you'll see or the next slide you'll see a video uh, a, an actual picture of what this horse is capable of um, and it wasn't fitting with him and then eventually Johan had the boundless out and we had a boundless made for him and on the far bottom right you see the the saddle without the numna underneath. That was the saddle that eventually fitted him and me and worked for both of us. And he has been happy in it for a good couple of months now. Um, there are a couple of things I wanna say here and we stress saddle fit for horses so tremendously, but there's a reason I put my personal journey up here because at a point during this little journey that's only got the five little pictures, but is really with this horse, probably the better part of a, a 20 month journey, um, if not slightly longer, probably two years in saddle, saddle issues. And from the better part, sometimes something would fit him and it wouldn't fit me. And it took Johan to point out to me that I had an anomaly with an extraordinary long thigh versus a lower, lower limb, which made things even more complicated. Um, and like I said before, this is a particularly sensitive horse. And this horse actually literally put me on the ground and busted my shoulder. Um, and nobody must, there, there, there was no, there was no misunderstanding that that horse meant to hurt me that day. Because most horses, when you fall off them and you just fall off them, will step away from you, run away from you because they get as much of a fright. On the day that I fell off this horse, he came and looked me in the eye. He literally physically walked across to me and he put his eyeball next to mine. He meant to put me there. Um, and the message was clear, I was being insensitive and I was trying to make something work that wasn't working and he'd been shouting it. Um, so my message here is basically, it's so important that A, the rider has a saddle that fits them. That was my problem with the prestige, which is the center oval picture. Um, I didn't fit in that saddle very well. 
Um, I always felt uncomfortable in it. I struggled very much to keep my lower leg back. It was really, really hard for me in that saddle. And that was my complaint right from the start. Um, saddle fitters met me with an argument that said, listen, um, it's the best you're going to do for you and your horse. It's the only thing that's going to work for both of you. And um, in the end, I gave in and it was... It was not the kindest thing for him and it was not the best thing for me. Um, so from that perspective, I encourage everybody to challenge it when people say that to you, hang, hang in there. Um, the right thing is out there and you will find it. And certainly with Schleser, I found that these saddles are so adaptable. I would have, sought, I would have saved myself well in the region of $6,000 in terms of losses on buying and selling saddles during this, this little exercise, um, which wasn't really worth it. And, and in the end, I could have been a lot further with this horse had I sort of known and done the right thing from the start. Just another key thing here. One of the mistakes that we made, which was not Schleser's fault, but um, a local saddle fitter, we, we never tried this horse in a saddle that we decided was going to work for him and for me. And when, we and when the saddle eventually came, we could never make it work for the combination of the horse and I. So my other message out here as a rider is always, always, 100% of the time, insist on trying the saddle on the horse yourself before you make a commitment to it and even riding it a few times. Um, so there are a couple of damage things that we get in terms of in terms of what saddles cause and everybody knows them. It's the white hairs that you get on the on the withers of the horse. It's the chafe marks that you get along the spine. You can get sores on the withers. You can get calluses and the paralumbar muscles that's a little bit more difficult to see um, it feels when you run your hands across the the saddle support area of the horse it feels like hard lumps and there are actual calluses that are forming and they are there because there, there is something that is creating pressure that shouldn't be there the last thing that uh in, in terms of primary saddle damage that you see, is you see ossification of the scapular cartilage, which is a piece of cartilage that sits at the top of the scapula, and that will start turning into bone. When it does, the horse loses its flexibility, and um, a lot of times will end up lame, and that is a that is a big no-no. Um, I think it's very close to Jochen's heart also, um, in terms of that kind of damage. But what I want to talk about more is secondary saddle damage because this tells us about stuff that can go wrong before any permanent change like the, the scapular cartilage becoming bone. That is a permanent change. There's no way out of it. Once it's done, the horse is done. Um, there's nothing I can do as a veterinarian to make that go away, but there are warning signs that it's going to happen. And I think the warning signs are more important than the actual fi the, the final change, because the final change is irreversible. There's nothing I can do. There's no magic in a bottle. There's nothing. There's no magic surgery. There's nothing that is going to change that. Um, but there are things that are going to warn you beforehand that will allow you to not let it get that far. One of the first things we see is muscle atrophy. And we see this in the paralumbar muscles. In other words, the muscles next to the spine. This you typically see when the spine sticks out a lot more above the other muscles. So the spine's higher than the muscles. Then there's an alteration of the horse's gait. Um, this we often see as the very first sign. Um, of, of a saddle actually impinging the horse, you will see a shortened stride in the front limbs. So the actual step of the horse will become shortened. Some horses start appearing like they're shuffling. Um, and it can be very misleading. It, it, can, it can be so 
so misleading that the rider doesn't feel the difference. It can be misleading to the people on the ground where they actually feel that the horse has got a lameness. Um, but the saddle can actually cause the horse to have up to a 30 centimeter shorter step with its front, front legs, which is huge if you consider that. Then the more subtle sign, which is really hard to quantify and you need a very feeling rider or a pressure plate um, or a sensor on the horse to actually establish is the changes in weight distribution. So a horse can shift its weight. It can shift it from the front to the back, from left to right and across the diagonal. One of their, one of their most effective ways of doing it is across the diagonal. So if it's hurting the left shoulder, they'll put all their weight on their right, on their right hock. And long-term, if that continues, you're gonna have hock problems, possibly hip problems. So that's what it is when we start talking about altered biomechanics. So now the horse moves differently, it, it lands differently. It now alters the way it carries its back. It's probably hollow. Um, it's doing several things in order to escape pain, but there is a price to pay for this. So often you'll find coffin joint problems, you'll find hock problems, you'll find hip problems and not necessarily primary shoulder problems. So I don't want people to think that the only thing that poor saddle fit is gonna cause is shoulder problems. There are much bigger things at play here and it can result in a permanent lameness. It can even result in a high suspensory injury if, you're, if your horse is overloading in order to escape pain. Long-term results that we look at is arthritis, and like I said, permanent damage that may be career ending. And we all know with, or all the riders know that a high suspensory injury can cost you up to two years and you're lucky if you rehabilitate a horse from that. Um, something that I don't think people talk about a lot and is very important to me are the rider consequences of poor saddle fit. Rider consequences, you know, we don't think about this but we're talking about falls, we're talking about injuries, neck injuries, back injuries, hip injuries, and repetitive strain injuries due to poor position. I have a very good friend of mine that a, was a high level dressage rider for many years. Um, she suffers with permanent neck arthritis because of an unnatural position that she needed to maintain in a saddle in order to do her sport. And I think that's a pretty big price to pay. Um, we get to live in our bodies for the rest of our lives. We need to think about us, but we also need to think about the horses. It's, it's a lot to ask a horse to sacrifice its body for our own, our own aspirations, our own ambitions. And that horse has to suffer arthritis because we wanted we wanted to win competitions. So I think people need to think about these things quite carefully. And as saddle fitters and, and riders, we need, to, we need to consider the fact that we can also suffer these injuries. Our lives are much longer. We only get one body to live in. And yeah, it's not the nicest place to be living if you're hurting. So, this is a slide I put in here and it's something, it's something I wanted to show just from the point of view, this was during the struggle of saddles for myself. Um, and what I wanted to de demonstrate here is kind of a secure leg position for a rider. And in the top where you see the knees in, in a much more forced, position and just below. So the top pictures are the same, the same saddle, um, just from two different sides. The bottom two pictures, same saddle, just two different right, um, sides. So the point that I'm making is you can see here, and this is me, I'm not using anybody else in the pictures. You can see that my knee is actually leaving the saddle. 
Um, so this is not a very secure position for a rider. This is not a very happy position for a rider. Um, there's not a lot of knee, or there's not a lot of saddle flap below my knee. Um, and the knee rolls mean nothing. And that's got to do with my anatomy, not, not, not so much the saddles, but it was something I wanted to point out. And then in the bottom right corner, you actually see me riding in the demo Schleser Boundless, um, which ended up working very well for me and very well for the horse. And you can see there's more saddle flap and actually the top of my boot is making contact with leather, which is what it's supposed to do. And these are things that I really want people to also consider when they consider saddle fit. The other thing in the corner that I wanted to demonstrate with this picture um, was just, if you look at it and don't just look at it at face value, you see there's no nomna underneath the saddle. And I can't stress this enough. I can't tell people enough. Fit a saddle, try a saddle without anything underneath. I mean, in this case, this is Larry, this is my gray. We stained him, he had a red stain on his body for about, I don't know, two weeks before it washed out. It wasn't a big price to pay. It gave us an idea to, to look at the, the sweat mark and the discoloration of his hair in terms of the saddle fit. It, it really helped, but it was a small price to pray to find out exactly what was a good fit for him. And to this day, I kind of go back here and I say, we fit without a numna and then we start fitting with a numna because it's got to fit the horse naked before we try and put something underneath it. And finally, this is the journey that we got to. So this is Mr. Larry jumping in his first show in his boundless. And this was a horse that was jumping flat. And normally over this particular height, which looks really, really small, it's an 80 centimeter fence. Um, and he hadn't jumped in a year. So this was his first little show out. Normally over the size of the fence, this horse would merely canter and not even lift. He wouldn't, there would be no jump to speak of. And if you look at him now, he's lifting through his shoulders. And one of the most beautiful parts, which you can just make out in the picture at the back here, he is pushing off the ground. And this is a novice, novice horse. And I can't tell people how, how important and how special this is and how much the saddle has enabled this horse to do this. He has never pushed off the ground like this. Now, the classic way of training show jumpers would be to go back, force him through, through many, many lines, force him into a pushing position, even if he is uncomfortable, even if his body couldn't do it, even if he was restricted. Um, you would then put him in lines that would force him to push with both back legs. That would have broken my horse. Um, and it does many, many horses because we're not addressing the thing that is stopping them from pushing. I don't know if anybody's ever watched a horse that is free jumping or actually just in the field jumping by themselves. They have no problem pushing. They only have a problem pushing when we're on their backs and we restrict them with equipment that does not allow them to utilize their thoracic sling, their abdominals, and their back appropriately. There's another point on this picture. There's a reason I picked this, this particular shot. There are a few better shots where he's got much more, much more elegant technique of lifting his front legs. But this particular picture shows you actually his thoracic sling coming into play. And I'm just gonna use my cursor. If you look here, you see his pectoral muscles in its actual groups contracting in order to allow this jump to happen. And that is spectacular. Um, it is very rarely seen. And I think it's underrated because this allows this horse to lift and not just lift, he's lifting his entire sternum and he's lifting all his shoulders. And the freedom that it's allowed him is remarkable. 
Um, from this point of view, I, I urge everybody to, to look for this when they're looking at a, at a jumper saddle, if you're looking at a dressage horse's saddle, it's not much different. You want to look for elevation. You know, um, I listened to a, a, a marvelous talk. It was also with Johan, I think it's a couple of years ago now. But, you know, if you watch horses and you watch a stallion trying to impress mares, the one thing they do to impress each other is they come off the ground, they have a moment of suspension, they hang in the air. And that is what I see is missing from dressage today. It's very sad because it's the most beautiful movement of a horse. But I think our saddles have a lot to do with it. We've got big knee blocks that hold, hold riders in place and don't necessarily allow horses the freedom of movement that they need. So I'd, I'd urge to look for a similar thing where the horse lifts actually through its chest into its wither rather than, than the, a, a fake flashy movement of legs along the floor. And it's not that I believe that the modern sport horse can't do it, they can. They certainly can do it in the paddock. They're capable of showing off like that to their friends. It's allowing them as close to that movement as possible because that's natural for them. It is what they, they're bred and built to do. And if we, if we work within those parameters, our horses will stay sound longer. So I wanna go through a few anatomical anomalies that can occur in horses, a few pathologies and things that can complicate things in terms of saddle fit and um, potentially training, but specifically today in, in terms of, of saddle fit. So my first thing is flat feet because they're, they're an implication for the spine, especially um, rear back feet, but front feet also um, implicates the way they can use their nuchal ligament, which is the ligament that runs across the top of the spine and allows the horse to balance itself and be economical over its back. Um, the second thing is transitional vertebrae that we've discovered occurs more often than you think. Then there's the big topic of kissing spine and I wanna add to the kissing spines facet joint arthritis because that is often overlooked. It often accompanies kissing spine and it more often than not causes more pain than kissing spine and is, is at the base of most horses with kissing spine. So we're gonna start with flat feet. And when I say flat feet, I mean flat feet. When we look at a horse's coronary band, which is the band of hair along here, it should be at an angle where it hits, if you drew a line from the top of the coronary band to the front foot, if we're looking at a back foot, it should transect the horse's leg just below the knee or the front leg. If this horse that I have in the top picture, if that was um, done with this horse, it would probably transect midway between its elbow and um, its bottom shoulder joint. Um, just don't, sorry about that. Um, and if that is terrible, the horse at the bottom here, this is a back foot. Um, there are a couple of clues here. We actually have what we call a negative palmer angle. I can see this because of this very round shape of the hoof wall in the front, which means my pedal bone, the bone inside the foot is actually pointing to the sky rather than to the floor. It should be at about a five degree angle pointing downwards. Um, that horse's coronary band, if we were to take that, it would probably, I would say, midway through its shoulder blade is where it was gonna um, transect the body. This makes for a few problems. Number one, in your, in your SI joint, you would now have added strain. 
because you've got strain over your over your hamstrings, all that fascia is being strained. And as a result of that, that often kicks the pelvis into a backward rotation or a forward rotation as most people call it. So now the back legs are behind the pelvis. You get a classic kink. I've got a horse later on that I'm gonna show you. He's got that classic dip in front of his lumbar vertebrae that shows me his feet are flat. It shows me that he's got that tilted pelvis. It also shows me that his spine's being impinged. And often, or there's literature out now that links this kind of foot conformation in the back to kissing spine. And kissing spine, as I've said, is linked to um, arthritis in the facet joints. If you don't understand that, I've got a few slides coming up. We'll, spill, we'll still talk about those. Um, Transitional vertebrae, um, like I said, those are, those are, I'm gonna just go dark. I don't think my, my um, torch is gonna, gonna last much longer. So, sorry, you don't get to see me anymore. Um, no problem, I can hear you. <laughs> The, the transitional vertebrae that we're talking about here, they happen in the lumbar vertebrae. It is at the point where the rib cage ends and we now start the lower back before we get the sacrum. So typically what we see with the transitional vertebrae is we've got one thing that wants to be a half rib and the other thing is the flat process that a normal lumbar vertebrae has. And in the bottom picture here, you can see it from the top. So you can now see, and there are a few things that are very important here. Um, you can see it can point forward, which means it can scratch on the, other, on the other ribs. It can point downwards, it can point straight out. It can do various things that are very un, unorthodox and can influence things as far as a saddle cloth or a numna is concerned. But the other thing that these vertebrae do, if you look at if you look at the center, which is the body over here, you can see that process on that side and the process on this side aren't the same distance. And that's not because it's not flat, it's flat. So what this means is that is the articulation point where it meets up with the rest of the, the spinal bodies. And if that is skew, this poor horse is always going to be skew. And th this is one of the big reasons why a saddle that's too long can cause so much discomfort. This is not something that you can always feel on a horse's body. And it's not something that you can always see, but it might very well be here. And this can be your chronic bucker because things are very uncomfortable for him. On the right hand side, you can see right in the front here, first lumbar vertebra, there's the transitional vertebra. It's half thoracic, half lumbar. It doesn't know what it wants to be. But what becomes clear is it actually affects the rest of the transverse processes. These things are not meant to touch each other. There is meant to be nerves that come off at the top and at the bottom of them. There's got to be room and space for them. So when this happens, these horses can be very, very uncomfortable. And a shorter saddle support area for them is crucial. Um, like I said, even, even a squish saddle cloth can actually irritate these horses. Now we get onto the spine. And there are a few things I want you to see here. So this is a vertebra where the last rib comes off. And that's your first lumbar vertebra over here. And you can see it's not meant to have any funky long ribs coming out of it. Um, now, this horse had very mild kissing spine. And what's been done here is the the spine's been laid out straight and flat. Now the spine doesn't sit like that. So this will, would overemphasize kissing spine. And though kissing spine's a big deal, 
from what I've seen in practice and what the last few years of research has taught me is that these horses are not that painful due to the spinous processes, but often they have and I'm going to show you on this particular one, which is the, the, first verte the first lumbar vertebrae over here. You can see there's a little roughened edge here on the articular facet. And it's very much there on the next one and the next one. And then the it ends kind of here. That's called facet joint arthritis. They're meant to be smooth. And if you get more towards the area where just under where you can see our pictures and things, you'll see a smooth one. This is an indication that this horse had facet joint arthritis. That's arthritis in his spine. And if kissing spine's painful, this is a thousand times more so. These horses roach their backs, their chronic buckers. Um, and this is, it, it doesn't just happen in this region. This particular spine happens to be in that region. Uh, you can, for argument's sake, say this horse is, I mean, we're behind the last vertebra. Um, so for argument's sake, you can say that, you know, this particular horse shouldn't have reacted like that, but you can see there's arthritis. So, this is another spine. This is far worse kissing spine. And I want to speak about this one a little bit more because it's far more obvious. Now, over here, you can see where the ribs are meant to be. So these are, that would be a rib, that would be a rib. And then when we move up, you can see how it's roughened and even that is roughened over there. And these are where this, the bodies of the, of the vertebra are actually articulating with each other. They sit on top of each other here. And that's where our arthritis is also coming into, into play. That's meant to be a smooth joint. When it's not, arthritis is painful. This horse must have been in agony, and, and I can't think that this horse was a, was a good candidate for riding. Um, the kissing spine is one thing. That is also one of the reasons why this, this, this new, the, or this, I, I don't want to call it a new discovery, but as we become more and more advanced in veterinary medicine and, and we've got more powerful machines, we can visualize more parts of of, of a horse than we could previously, um, you need a pretty powerful X-ray to, to shoot this kind of spine picture if you're not over the lung field. And in those cases, most of the cases, you will not see the articular facets in a spine. So for many years, we've missed this facet joint arthritis and we've blamed it on the kissing spine when in fact, these horses suffer from facet joint arthritis and and it needs to be attended to and it is as in this horse it's right under where our rider would sit the classic way people address this is with corticosteroids i'm not a fan i would never recommend it it's it's a short-term gain for a long-term big price to pay um it wears off in three to four months. You've got to repeat it. And before long, the, the horse's spine fuses. And then fortunately the pain is gone. And this is why I brought up this particular spine. Um, at the bottom here, this is what a spine that's trying to fuse looks like. It's what we call spondylosis. So this particular spine has got arthritis. It's trying to stabilize itself. It's trying to become a, brid, a rigid bridge so that the horse can function. And the entire process as it carries on is particularly painful. It's only once it's solid that the pain goes away. But there is another price to pay because the horse ends up in nerve pain. Um, like I said, where we see these holes on the side here, this is where our nerves come through. It's really important that the nerves be, 
be able to be free. It's a nerve root that comes off here. If there's no room for that nerve root, then what we end up with is a very, very, very painful horse because now we've got trapped nerves. Um, this is just another picture of a spine. So I can show you guys some more facet joint arthritis. This is a beautiful example of it. That is our facet joint. This is seeing it from a from a good angle in order to highlight it. You can see the roughened edges. Typically, this is what happens inside a joint when arthritis is present. The body lays down extra bone. The bone's no longer covered by cartilage. It's no longer a smooth surface. It's now grinding away on a raw surface. And I, I hope I explained that in a painful enough manner for people to to comprehend how very painful these horses are. Typically on these horses, you see the spine stick out and they're, they're unable to build muscle next to the spine. You see a dent down. Um, I often suspect it when we see that kind of spine. It's So this is the horse that I was gonna show you. And here you see muscle wastage. And I wanted, this guy specifically, he's a massive horse. You'll get a full body picture of him in a minute, but you can see he's, he's actual trapezius. The thoracic portion is non-existent. That's all wasted away. We're seeing on his scapular spine, which is round about here. Um, you see a lack of muscle building around here. It's just not capable of doing it. And he's, he's just got a lack of muscle. And this, this guy jumps one meter, one meter 50 in spite of this. This is him from a, a more full body angle, um, seeing the horse and you see the definite dip in here. And then when I spoke about the fact that these guys tip their pelvis forward, you can see here, if I try and do a triangle, that that leans slightly forward and there's the dip that I speak about. Just before we hit the lumbar vertebrae, we have a dip in that top line spine, right there. And that's typical, he's got flat, flat feet in the back and that contributes to all of this. It will contribute to, to saddle fit because he'll be very uneven. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, and also makes it very hard to build muscle on a horse like this. And I'd like to open the floor for quick questions and answers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Catalina. That was such a great presentation. Yes, that was, um, as always, um, I was floored and I heard you now speak a couple of times and it's always something what strikes me is, wow, this is new and it's not, but it res <laughs> resonated this time a little bit more. So great. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, one of the things what I thought was really, really interesting you say the horse is not able to, 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 to build muscle when they have these long-term damages. Could you elaborate a little bit more why that is? Um, a lot of it is because nerves become trapped. Um, we know a lot more about fascia today than we did even two years ago. So fascia was just, discounted as just uh, the white stuff around muscles that was in our way when we did dissections and you kind of just bluntly cut it away when you were doing surgery and you threw it in the bin. Today we understand that it has its own network of nerves, it's the biggest organ in the body and where it becomes restricted and bound down it will actually constrict blood flow to muscle and it will stop that muscle from developing completely. So fascial restrictions, I think, are highly discounted and they're very, very important because unless you release them, even if you got everything right, the muscle's not going to come back. The other, thing, the other thing that does it is 
when a nerve is so compressed that the muscle stops firing and you know the back muscles of a horse is it's not just one muscle it looks like one muscle but it's a it, it's it's a number of different mu muscles put together that are meant to fire as one and separate individual parts of it can stop firing and when it stops firing because of nerve compression it's never gonna it's never gonna build a muscle actually has to contract in order to build yes yes wonderful i don't want to hog the floor so mary claire you said you had some questions from the audience i do thank you um i'll pass this to paula um her question she sent in via email was how can muscles be rehabbed from poor saddle fit white hairs pressure damage etc should there be a period of no saddling before riding in a properly fitted saddle yes but that or not that alone is not going to be enough i hate to say it that alone won't be enough you'd have to get either ett work done to release the fascia fascial release done to release the fascia and then electrical muscle stimulation done in order to get the to get the muscle to start building, it's going to be very, very difficult to build it under a new saddle. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll take one more question, then I can pass it back to Jochen for another little discussion, as so we have a few more minutes. Um, so another question we received uh, was, what are some of the universal adverse reactions to specific saddle fit issues? Um, are we talking about behavior? Um, yes. if, it's, if it is BA behavior, um, bucking, rearing, um, spinning, running. I've seen many horses run, um, especially in, in jumpers, they'll run. Um, and people will say they run through your hand or they're just blindly running at fences. Um, they'll shuffle. I've seen horses shuffle. I've seen horses unable to make a long stride, chip one in and the riders fall off because the horse can't make a long distance. Um, but the classic ones, I mean, horses tell you. Um, horses are, we need to look, at, look them in the eye more often and we need to watch their faces more often. You can often see a horse with a poor saddle fit do nothing more but have a grimace on its face. Um, or you can see them have the ears flat back constantly when they're under saddle. Um, when this gray of mine was at his worst, you would present the saddle and he would actually snap like a crocodile at you. <laughs> um, and that was without putting a saddle on his back. If you came to his stable carrying a saddle, he, he'd try and bite you. Um, and that is a pretty clear clue. But <laughs> we, we, we humans are, are pretty slow to catch on. Um, and there is a difference. I mean, I, I, I love this picture of him because he's pretty happy that day. Um, and he just jumped his first ever combination. You can't see it because it's not in the picture. Um, and they get to a point where they do something that is happy and expressive. And that's why I love this picture. This was a, I am so proud of my, myself moment. And they tend to leap and buck then. But the big thing about this picture is when we look at it, his ears are forward. He's a happy horse. Mm -hmm. It's not because his saddle's hurting him. It's because yeah. he thinks he's really clever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think that's, that, that's the key here. I mean, because some horses are going to be overt in their expression and some horses are going to be subtle in their expression. And we've got to be careful that we listen to even the subtleties. Yeah. They don't need to come snapping crocodiles before <laughs> we hear. That's right. What they have to say. Yeah. Exactly. Catalina, if you uh, let me share the screen I have, um, a screen I like to share. Sure, share. I'm going to stop mine. Even though I do like that picture a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me see if I get this up here. 
there is a, 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 a picture. Um, well, this is, of course, you <laughs> in all the different countries you worked at. <laughs> but the actual, uh, let me see where it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we talked about uh, uh, fascia, we talked about uneven uh, horses and the, the shoeing was, was fascinating. So in our trade, you know, we, we have horses who have unevenness. It, it was beautiful explained with your transitional vertebrae. And especially in the jumper, you know, when we have our weight in the stirrup, um, leathers, they're hung on the front of the saddle and the stirrup bars. And when we do saddle testing, we can see the pressure most of the time at the base of the wither, the, the trapezius, which you showed was atrophied. One of the features on your boundless saddle is that the stirrup bar is connected completely differently rather than the traditional way, like 99.9% .9 of saddles have the stirrup bar. But um, rather than just the stirrup bar, I always want to come back to the um, unevenness. And this is in our, um, I would say, industry as saddle fitters, a very uh, um, discussed point. When a horse is uneven, structural or muscular, they say leave the gullet plate, the metal plate, what goes over the withers right here, leave it even. So when I see the hoof and when I see the, the bone structure, the, the damage it can, and then I see um, other technologies such as thermography. And I see we have a massive amount of pressure on the front left and that shifts the saddle, put pressure on the lumbar. And then we saw all the problems which you demonstrated so wonderful. In my question to you is if we have horses who are loud and clear, like my favorite saying is always, you know, look at the horse, they don't lie. Look at the eyes, the ears, the mouth. But if we have horses which are clearly not 100% symmetrical, how can we train a horse straight if I put a symmetric gullet plate and then a, a, a gullet plate what has on top, uh, the stirrup bar on top, on a horse what has atrophied with a muscle, or as I said, is built like this due to deformity in the bones or in the hoof. So in your profession as a veterinarian, would it not be smarter to open the tree on the left to give that bigger bone more room, or should there be a symmetric metal plate behind the shoulder? I believe you have to foot to the horse. I mean, there's a reason we kept working until we found something that worked for me and worked for my horse. And we kept working with Schleser for that because it's the only, it's the only, it's the only technology I know that, that allows you to fit to an unsymmetrical horse. Um, I, it's not very clear on Larry because I didn't show you guys that. I could have shown you. He's radiographs of his front foot. He has a, a mildly, not rotated, but um, tilted pedal bone to the outside, which means the inner, inner side's higher than the outer side, which means the hoof is slightly contorted. Um, and as long as you respect his bone column, he stays sound. If you don't respect the bone column, he'll go lame. And I mean, he'll, he'll jump into the big classes and he'll stay sound his whole life. But it, you'd have to respect that bone column. So if I was stupid enough to have remained in a saddle with a fixed gullet, I would have crippled him. Wow. Because I would have, 
I would have allowed him um, to make adjustments in weight placement that would have compromised that bone that is slightly off. Mm -hmm. But instead, we had him in an MRI, we had him in several things. Now we allow him to be barefoot and we trim him in a certain way. And with his boundless saddle, in which he's very happy, he is now allowed to move with that shoulder that is slightly different than the other one mm -hmm. to his own personal freedom, which is perfect for the horse and will ensure his longevity because you're not impinging him. Thank you so much, because this is what, as a saddle maker, you know, it's, you hear sometimes trainer says, oh, you just need to launch this a, a book out, how to straighten a horse with lunging. But if we have bone deformity, or like you explained with Larry with his hoof, you know, how can you do this to training, riding, or lunging, if this is like, come on, we humans are not 100% symmetric either. So I was always on the belief, and thank you for verifying that, that you got to fit to the horse. And if that side is bigger, that metal plate got to be bigger on that side, of course, without twisting the tree. Yeah. And Claire, do you have any more questions from the audience? I do have a few more questions. Um, so another question we have is, can you separate saddle fit from rider error? Okay. Yeah, that's your division. <laughs> you want my division? Okay. So um, if I look at the, um, let me have a look here quick, see if I find this. All right, so here, here's another um, slide of what I just talked about in terms of the bigger shoulder. If I don't, um, this is a, I think a quote from another veterinarian. Oh yeah, from Dr. Kerry Ridgeway. You know, so if, if I don't allow it, the shoulder will want to go through here and it kicks that over. So that's just to, to finish that. So back to the question you just asked me. So I always think about sitting on a barrel, swimming down the river. So if I don't have a good core and I don't sit in the center of the barrel, not too far forward, too far back, left or right, I will tip the barrel. And as we know, the human head is pretty heavy and is on top of the whole pivot point. That is, of course, a big question. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is the horse's behavior or the saddle fit problem caused by the saddle? For example, this is a study out of England and you can see the saddle is pretty straightforward, but the rider keeps falling to the side. And here we have a opposite, you know, the, the saddle goes to the right and the rider completely overcompensate. I always like to say, start off by looking at when a person comes towards you in a rising trot, look at the stirrup leathers. You know, it's look at the horse. Is he tracking up straight? Does he go on two tracks? And here we see the rider on the left falls to the right and the rider on the right falls to the left. Look at the stirrup leather. Sure, you could say, oh, the stirrup leathers were uneven. But this is a very, 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 very common. This is a picture I put on my second book. A very common issue that the saddle goes to one arrow. So we need to under understand, is the behavior of the horse caused by the rider? Because I just want him to force through it. Or like uh, Catalina was just saying, I, I ignore to, to, to listen to them. You know, so this, these are pictures we've seen too often, but another colleague of uh, Dr. Catalina Thiersen, one of the first books I ever read on saddle fit was by Joyce Harmon. And, and she used the title of pain-free back. You know, the horse does experience pain. And um, if, there is pain, you know, then the horse will react as, as wonderful explained. So when is it a rider arrow? When is it the saddle arrow? So we need to look at the or, or horse issue. 
I think we need to, I, I hate to harp on this, but there is two beings, you know, the horse and the rider. And when I try to act a professional such as Dr. Kalina Thurston, when it comes to the rider, I want to talk to medical doctors, gynecologists. And when they tell me there is a massive difference, okay? And there is difference when I buy my underwear, jeans, shoes, even in the bicycle seats, I, I buy specific uh, one for male, one for female, but in saddle it's not. And if the medical industry says there's a lot of rider induced problems because they're not aligned shoulder, hips and heels. I mean, let's remember what um, Carolina just said, you know, a friend of hers, dressage rider has no permanent arthritis pain in the neck because the way their saddle was forcing this person. So the rider compensates because the saddle might hit in the crotch, not for the male, but for the female. So the female now has to ride in the male sponsored saddle and she has to protect herself, sits back and then boom, put all the pressure here. So yes, the answer is to the question, it is a rider endorsed problem if it doesn't fit the saddle, just like Catalina showed with the wonderful pictures of there's not enough flap for her leg. Excellent, thank you, Jochen, and thank you, Catalina, for joining us for today's uh, session. We really appreciate your time. I can't believe how quickly the hour flew by. We definitely need no to have kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need to have you back at Delana for another for another episode down the I know I can listen to hours and hours. Yeah. You make it so Great. nice. Please, you are... I'd love to do another one. Oh, yeah. Definitely, definitely we'll book you <laughs> in. All right. Thank you guys so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.